the third in our um, fall lecture series, and we're delighted to have everybody here. Um, this is this is a, should be a really interesting talk. I'm curious to hear more about it because it was something in my family that I um, grew up hearing about one grandmother who was in New York City during um, the epidemic in 1918 and how dreadful it was. So we're going to find out more about that. Um, it's always a pleasure to welcome Don and have him come and speak. We were just talking about you know, miserable weather, and but Don has a following, and I, I swear we, we could say he's going to read the phone book still turn up and just, <laughs> just listen. Um, but he's a wonderful speaker, a wonderful historian, um, and we're really delighted to have him. He has an illustrious past career, but his current career is pretty wonderful too. Um, and um, so he, he, and these, these lectures really are um, just a joy for everyone. So it's my pleasure to welcome Don Dover. Thanks. Thank Two things before I start. This is my notebook. I have some notes in it, but half the pages are blank. So just to let you know, don't panic. <laughs> the other thing is uh, I always start the lecture uh, with the admonition that my father gave me. My father would go to church, and if the minister spoke too long, my father tapped his watch. And the longer the minister went, the higher the watch went, because my dad believed that the, that the uh, mind can absorb only what the seat can endure. So if I see you going like this, and uh, when I was teaching, I had students, I'd walk into class, and before I started, they'd go. <laughs> so if I see you doing that, I'm well aware. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. It's a tragic topic, but it's one that I have to tell you. I have to give more credit to the town of Marblehead for what happened in 1918. Um, I have a personal interest because I lost an uncle uh, in the flu epidemic. And I'm looking at the age of some of the people out there and I'm going to say we knew what some of that was like when somebody had measles or mumps or chicken pox and you had that pink quarantine notice Got, that got nailed to the door. I know what it was like during the polio epidemics. And I'm wearing my polio pioneer pin because I was one of the kids at Elbridge Gerry School who took the first vaccine to see if it would work. And I'm a twin, and my twin brother didn't get it, and I did. And I carry this to show people that I'm a polio pioneer 1954. And because it worked, other kids got the square needles jabbed into them. Um, so we know what it was like. Marblehead is no stranger to sickness. Uh, I look back on the epidemics in the town of Marblehead, and I can look back in 1730, three selectmen die from smallpox, and the town is isolated. They simply close the borders. And if you came in, there was a building that you had to go into and they smoked you. They built it, a fire up with smoke, truly believed that the smoke would eliminate the smallpox. Well, it didn't because 20 years later, there's another smallpox epidemic. 10 years later, there's another smallpox epidemic. 1773, there's one, that's when they built the hospital out on Children's Island. And the town folks were so scared that the disease would come that a couple of Marlboro headers rode out and lit the hospital on fire. They were arrested, taken to Salem jail, and a thousand Marlboro headers marched to Salem, broke into the jail, and brought them back. Who said Marblehead is not independent? <laughs> smallpox two years later, 1800 smallpox, um, and Dr. Story, uh, who is a physician here in Marblehead, had read about inoculation. He decided that he would inoculate a number of people in the town. The problem was it was a bad dose of the uh, vaccine and 64 people died of the smallpox. 1820, measles epidemic. 1843, cholera. 1844, whooping cough. 
1846, typhoid fever. 1873, smallpox. And then 1918, amazing. Population of the town is 7,338. One out of every seven children came down with the flu. Wasn't a single person in town that did not contract the flu. Now there are hundreds of names for it. It's called the three-day fever, the sweating fever. You hear that in Britain. And what it is is the flu. The Jolly Rant, the Grip, the Purple Death, the Spanish Influenza, Flanders uh, fever, Sand Fly fever, Black Whip, the Bolshevik disease, and the Great Cold Flu. I even read in 1918 where the war had just got over and the story went around Marblehead that there was a German plot to kill people and that they had made up a medicine, bare aspirin, and people refused to take it because it was a German plot to kill people. And I'm thinking that bare aspirin could have reduced fever in this uh, disease. Flu goes back. We know 1860, uh, 1680, and then we find every 10 to 30 years that flu comes. Well, what makes 1918 so different? Well, 1918 is not an epidemic. It's a pandemic. There are villages that are totally destroyed. <laughs> A, and by the way, it was very interesting. The worst state to be hit with the flu, does anyone know where it was? Massachusetts was really the first one. But do you know the state that was the worst state that had a uh, mortality rate of estimate of 30 to 40 percent? Alaska. This disease struck not in the cities, but in the countryside, it struck in the smaller towns because the immunity in the cities was higher because the hygiene was poor. And it was amazing that as I read this, and this is one of the first diseases that strikes the healthy, not the sick. Pregnant women had a better chance of getting the flu and dying from it. The age is 30, anywhere from 18 to 33. That's the victim. Um, and what was it like? Pain in the eyes, ears, neck, spine, legs, fever, chills, three days. And either you got better or you got pneumonia and you were dead in two days, five days. First case of influenza, Boston, Massachusetts. Very quiet. Although it had been in Europe, it takes place at the Commonwealth Pier, the 7,000 sailors that have come back from World War I and they're all crowded into the barracks in Boston. August 29th, 1918. You're going to hear me go by days and it's only going to be a two month span. Eight cases on August 28th in Boston. Chelsea Naval Hospital the same day reports 58 cases, all military. The next day, 81 more cases. The next day, 106 more cases. On September 3rd, 1918, the first civilian gets the flu. And where had he been? at the Red Sox game, World Series, against the Chicago Cubs. And as they looked at the people who went to that game, they discovered five of the people that were there died. They were the major carriers of that flu. Nobody from Marblehead has the flu yet. This is what Marblehead was like, 7,000 people, Board of Health, Names that are going to be significant. William Clothy is the chairman. Dr. Franklin Ireson. Any of you remember Dr. Ireson in the town of Marblehead? He, he served on the board, and I have to tell you, he's one of the heroes of the story. And then Horace Sweetland. 
There are three undertakers in town. They're going to be significant. George Nichols up on Pleasant Street, Richard Rockard on Sewell Street, and William O'Brien on Atlantic Avenue. The doctors in town, Dr. Herbert Hill. He's off military service. By the way, of 140,000 doctors in the United States, 50,000 of them are in the military and in Europe. So it hits the time when one third of the doctors are out of the country. Dr. Samuel Eveleth, called up for military service, sent to Georgia. Dr. Arson, Dr. Prouty, Dr. Dunham, and Dr. Pearlie Sanborn. That's it for, Mar for Marblehead. School population, 1,300 kids out of 7,000. September 6th, everything's very quiet. They have a big event, Liberty Day, Lafayette Day events. People turn out. September 10th, a Tuesday. First death, William A. Hammond, a fireman from Marblehead, died, and Dr. Ireson says it's tomain poisoning from eating a turkey dinner. If only we knew. The very next day, September 13th, a Friday, the Navy now reports 163 more cases. Fort Devens reports 50,000 people present, 12,000 have pneumonia. They locked down Fort Devens. And by the time this finishes, 20,000 soldiers will have died in those military forts. And it's interesting how they described it. They called them mahogany death. What happened was all of a sudden they would get a mahogany coloring around their cheeks. It would drain and then into the body and within two hours they were dead. Think about what that was like in 1918. Symptoms, sore throat, fever, headache, Body of the color of white ashes, heart enlarges, lungs six times its weight, filling with fluid, projectile bleeding after death. You know what that means? This is not, I mean, this is dangerous. This isn't epidemic for us, but pandemic for the world. If you survived, you only had cases of pneumonia or you lost your hearing, or your hair, hair turned white. My father was diagnosed with it, he's 17, and in those days, by the way, newspapers wouldn't publish obituaries. And my dad told the story that, the story went around that he had died of the flu, and some of his school chums came to the door to express their sympathy, and he met them at the door. <laughs> but just think, you lived your life not knowing who was going to die in the town that day or the next day. Oh, by the way, these are all the ways you could treat the flu according to 1918. I read the papers. Uh, you could make a necklace of chicken feathers. You could uh, burn corn cobs and breathe the smoke. Uh, you could stuff your shoes with the ace of diamonds. You gargled with salt water. That's what the military required each of their soldiers to do every morning. Um, you could smoke cigars. That's not a bad suggestion. Um, you could use strychnine. I, I think that's not a, such a good idea. You could eat red peppers. You could cover yourself in kerosene. You could use castor oil. Uh, you could be given an electric shock, and I like this one. You could carry a potato in each one of your pockets. <laughs> and then the better one, whiskey, gin, and brandy. And I thought, well, if you're going to go, at least that's a good way. Milk toast, hot towers, a towel soaked in vinegar. Uh, eat asparagus and onions. So my wife's here. Linda, I don't have to eat asparagus unless I'm sick. Um, and this is what it was like in the town of Marblehead. No handshaking, no library books. If you spit on the street, you'd be arrested. You didn't touch doorknobs. Phone booths were locked up. Telephones were washed down with rubbing alcohol. And all drinking fountains were closed. 
And what do we call them in New England? If I said bubblers, people outside of New England have no idea what I'm talking about. Marblehead gets it September 14th, 1918. It's a spirit of good community. We took 100 wounded soldiers that had just come back from Europe, brought them into Marblehead, entertained them at a baseball game, fed them, and gave them stuff to drink, and off they were gone. The very next day, four cases of the flu are reported in Marblehead. It's here. September 18th, uh, uh, September 16th, 10 cases. September 17th, 40 cases. September 18th, a Wednesday, school committee meets and closes the schools at noontime. Closed for a week. Out of the 1,200 kids, 236 have the flu. All matinee performances at the, y at the uh, Warwick Theater are closed. Children are forbidden to come to night shows if you are under 16. Churches are asked to close their Sunday schools. By the end of the day, there's 100 cases of flu, new cases. And then the Salem News publishes headlines. A young man, 30 years of age, son of the President of United Shoe, is dead of pneumonia. The first time the Salem News or Marblehead Messenger mentions the word flu. Dr. Benjamin, uh, excuse me, Officer Benjamin Dolliber's family are all sick with the flu. Howard sent to the Chelsea Naval Hospital, worst place to go. That's where they have major cases. Earl is at home on Washington Street. Ralph Gordon, uh, Evelyn, Helen, and Ben are all at the, at the grandparents' house on Pleasant Street. On the 19th of September, Thursday, school committee and Board of Health meet. They're not happy. Massachusetts sets an emergency uh, health committee. Salem News, the Board of Health says, this is not a contagious disease, there is no need to panic. That day, Salem reported 1,000 cases of flu. Five burial permits were being issued every 30 minutes in the city of Salem. There is a report of 6,000 new cases at Fort Devens. I don't know what I would have done. I might have gone out to sea at that stage. <laughs> September 20th. The Messenger publishes the rules to avoid the flu. Board of Health Chairman, Mr. Cl uh, Clothing, avoid contact with all suspected individuals. Get sunshine and plenty of ventilation. By the way, that was probably the best advice. Get good nourishing food and keep personal hygiene. Churches are still meeting. But they report the drive for clothing for the children in Belgium has been postponed for two weeks. The next day, the first death in Marblehead is reported. It's not in our paper because they had taken him to Salem Hospital where he died. So Salem gets credit, but not Marblehead. Salem is so short of telephone operators, they are hiring people off the street. That day, they reported 1,500 new cases of flu in the city of Salem. Gloucester sends out emergency appeal to Salem. Every one of the six doctors in Salem is sick with the flu. They need nurses. They need help. They set up a hospital over the police station, but nobody to work it. Sunday, the next day, it's called the Churchless Sunday. Churches didn't cancel, people just didn't go. Second death. School committee meets at 11 o'clock with the Board of Health. The 23rd, third case, 23-year-old man dies of pneumonia with influenza. The state on that day reported 333 deaths that day. Salem, 10 deaths. Chelsea, 13. Boston, 50 deaths per day. September 24, 1918, a Tuesday. Epidemic appears to be better. The paper said, it's great. What they didn't know is that the epidemic works in waves. 
Salem now requests volunteers. Salem Hospital is full and they refuse anyone admission to Salem Hospital. Salem High School closes, all the teachers are sick with the flu. The 25th of September, two deaths, 26 year old woman and a six year old child. It is perhaps the worst day for Salem, not the worst day for Marblehead. It's in a day of an election, the voter turnout is 10%. Uh, the, here they get a telegram from the chairman of the emergency committee. He says the germs are transmitted by sick people. Stay away from them. Salem closes all their public and private schools. Dr. Ireson in the town of Marblehead goes to bed at 6 p.m. because he has seen 135 victims that morning. The rumor goes he's sick. What has really happened is he's exhausted. The next day, September 26, 400 more cases reported in the town of Marblehead. The young girl who died the day before, her sister of 15 months dies of the flu. The Board of Health forbids all dances. They ask women to volunteer for nurses. Problem, there are so many parents sick, children are going without food because there's nobody there to cook the food for them. So, uh, the Surgeon General is asked, U.S. Surgeon General receives a request from the Governor of Mass, Calvin Coolidge, send us help. The same appeal went to the President of the United States, Wilson. He couldn't do anything. Um, Salem, they've closed all their hospitals. Peabody, they've opened an emergency room. And then came September 27th, Friday, and I marked that as a bad day. The wife of Dr. Prouty dies of the flu, 34 years of age. Warwick Theater voluntarily closes. No more movies. Board of Health starts looking for a hospital. Here are the places they get, they're going to look in the town of Marblehead. Abbott Hall, the old townhouse up across from, uh, excuse me, the old high school across from Nichols Funeral Home. The Oddfellows Building, which is the Masons. The YMCA offered the building. But the police chief, who is another hero in the scene, Frank W. Goodwin, suggested that they take the brand new high school on Workhouse Rocks. It had just been finished. It has up-to-date facilities. And let's use it for a hospital. The school committee said no, and the Board of Health seized the high school. Immediately, Dr. Goodwin telegraphs Boston and says, we need a doctor. Boston sent a doctor within a day, Dr. Burton Connor of Boston, Mass., who is now going to be the doctor of that hospital. Mrs. Helen Eveleth, the wife of Dr. Eveleth, volunteers to be the head nurse. Andrew Stone, the health agent, goes out to get 27 beds and everything else that goes with it. And by midnight, they have 27 beds and everything else set in that hospital. Three individuals volunteer to serve as nurses. The library is used for the female victims of the influenza. And the room above for the males. They drafted teachers to take care of the males upstairs. And the football coach, um, Edward Pigeon, serves for one month as the male nurse. In the kitchen, they have two people who will be cooking constantly. The town farm will produce the eggs and the vegetables. Three girls, one of which is Helen Mace, volunteer, children, volunteer to work the telephones. And the police chief, Mr. Goodwin, works in the basement washing the soiled linens from the victims. The entire police department is put on 24-hour duty, working the new motorized ambulance and carrying the victims in and out of the hospital. 
no extra pay. Board of Health postponed the Liberty election, canceled all baseball games, required that there would be no church services. They closed the library, which was then at Abbott Hall. Schools remained closed for another week. YMCA is shut down. The cooperative bank cancels all of their meetings. No band concerts, no public gatherings. This is what the Salem Board of Health wrote on that day in the Salem News. There is no need to, be, to panic, this is not a plague. <laughs> the editor of the Marblehead Messenger comes down with the flu, but the newspaper continues to be published. Dr. Ison reported that day he visited 75 new cases of the flu. The next day, six ill patients are admitted, the most critical. Of the six, three will be dead within two days. The next day, the Tatamava Head reports, winter's coming. The workers refuse to deliver coal to the houses of the ill people. Two more individuals are admitted to the hospital. One of them, I, I feel so badly when I read this, Elmer M. Brown. He went to Salem Hospital. Salem Hospital met up in the door and told him we're full. Try and find better treatment somewhere. He found a shack on Bessem's Beach and he crawled into the shack to die. The police find him. They bring him to the hospital and he's admitted 12.30 p.m. and he's dead the next day. September 30th, a Monday. Three more people admitted they will end up dying in that hospital. September, 13 dead in Marblehead. And mind you, that's only midway September and the disease hasn't reached its high point yet. Soda fountains are closed. October 1st, 1918, one year old child dies of the flu. Hospital admits two more. Of the two, one will die. Marblehead undertakers are running out of coffins. They're asked to come to Salem because the Salem undertakers can't keep up with the dead. So George Nichols and William O'Brien now spend all their time in Salem. Topsfield Fair is canceled. The state indicates 40,000 cases as of October 1st, not counting the military and it's now moving to the western part of the state. Um, the Sisters of Charity, who owned Loring Villa, that Salem State extension off of Loring Avenue, volunteers their building to take 60 to 70 patients in Salem. The Salem Board of Health finally accepts their help. Two more people admitted to the hospital. 127 will die the next day. 132 will die the next day. High school teacher sick with influenza, he dies two days later. Salem Hospital opens the Salem Villa Emergency Hospital. Icemen are now refusing to go to homes in Salem and in Marblehead because of the flu. October 3rd, four people admitted, four people die. Then comes something that I thought was interesting. Federal government can't help, state government can't help, but the YMCA said, look, we can cook food if they can come and get it. So the Red Cross said, we will pick up the cost of the food. So they uh, cooked soup, served cornbread and custard, 16 cents a quart, and if you couldn't afford it, Red Cross, would underrate the cost. Finally reached a stage where families couldn't come to get the food, the police department ended up delivering the food. Within one week, that canteen is overwhelmed by requests. So a Mrs. Parker Kimball on Washington Street sets it up in her house and continues serving the food to families that cannot cook. October 4th, first time ever 
Massachusetts physicians are required to report the cause of death as well as all cases of the flu. So from that date on, we can start to see the numbers. Boston finally closes all its schools. Hospital admits one more patient and discharges one. Court system in Essex County closes. All parades cancel. Two of the nurses drive the doctors around town so that they can find uh, individuals that are sick with the flu and can't get out. Surgeon General recommends that all troops coming back from Europe be quarantined. Wilson refuses to follow that recommendation and more troop ships are brought into Ma Boston, Massachusetts. <clears throat> October 5th, Saturday. One patient admitted, two patients die. One patient discharged. October 6th, the Sunday. One person dies, one person is admitted. The 7th of October, one person dies, one person admitted. By the way, age, two years. Local nurse, Marjorie Grant, exhausted. She's replaced by a local nurse. October the 8th, Tuesday, no public funerals in the town of Marblehead. Police that have been carrying victims now begin to come out in the flu. Wilson now orders five days later all troop ships to remain where they are. Letters are sent to teachers by the school committee. We want you to come to the high school and serve as nurses. Fourteen of them show. Four of the patients that had been released from the emergency hospital in the old high school had been released too early. They are readmitted to the hospital. <clears throat> Boston even tried experiments. They started it, volunteers from prisons and they started injecting them with what they thought caused the disease. None of those volunteers came down with the flu. October 9th, one in, one dead. October 11th, one dead, one in, three discharged. Less new cases, but the cases that were coming in were now critical. Next day, the 12th, we're getting closer, by the way, to us, the date today. One dead, one dismissed. Next day, one dismissed. The 14th, one dead, one admitted. The 15th, one dead, two months old. Chief nurse, Mrs. Helen Evelith, contracts the flu and is sent home. This is Dr. Samuel Evelith's wife, the chief nurse. The next day, a 22-year-old woman dies of the flu. On the 17th of September, Dr. Samuel Evelith has been called from the military fort in Tennessee to get home before his wife dies. October 18th, no deaths in the last 24 hours. Nine people in the hospital improving. Eight have died. Fewer new cases. Board of Health refuses to lift the church bans. They give a special parade, a permit. The parade can march, but they can't stop. Local undertakers are running out of caskets again. Football practice does resume. So I guess there's always uh, important things in life. <laughs> October 19th, and Mrs. Samuel Evelith, 30 years of age, one week of illness, dies. By the way, the next time you're in Waterside Cemetery, go up to the high point where the gazebo is, right where the veterans' graves are. Just go a little further, and you will see the gravestone of Dr. Evelith and Mrs. Helen Evelith. <clears throat> that day, the entire town knows that this nurse is sick. They're waiting. At the time she died, the Old North Church, Star of the Sea, and Abbott Hall rings their bells. Marblehead stops dead in their track. 
things are getting better. Three people dismissed from the hospital. No deaths, October 20th. Boston does something very interesting. Their hospitals are so crowded, they call for military tents, and they put the victims in those tents October 20th. And the mortality rate dropped by 50% because of the fresh air, the lack of contact. And all of a sudden, people paying attention isolate the disease. 22nd funeral for Mrs. Eveleth. Four more people are discharged. Last patient leaves the hospital on October 23rd. The next day, they fumigate the hospital. Guess how they fumigated it? Smoke. Board of Health lifts all public bans except druggists and now told you can serve ice cream only in individual dishes. You can't share ice cream. Elementary schools open on the 28th. High school will open a year later. Another death from pneumonia, two years old. It's the flu again. 23 deaths just in the month of October. Well, that emergency hospital and Marblehead stepped up and set it up from September 28th to October 22nd, 24 days, 24 patients, eight died, roughly one out of every three admitted to the hospital. Board of Health goes to a special town meeting and says we need $1,800 to cover the cost of the hospital. Marblehead, in total, officially lost 42 people in those 24 days. What was the world like? One half of the entire world's population was sick with the flu in 1918. Estimate, 40 million people are dead of the flu. Victims average age, 33. Every single person in the United States have been exposed. Two week recovery. Of that, 20% developed pneumonia. And the estimate for Marblehead, uh, for, excuse me, for the United States, 670,000 dead of the flu in those 24 days. Then I started to trace it. And I see October 1918, flu. November 1918, no flu. December, January 1919, flu. February 1919, no flu. March 1919, flu. April, September 1919, no flu. November 1919, flu. December 1919, no flu. January, February, flu. What's happening is the flu virus is mutating. It's coming back in wave after wave after wave. The one advantage, every single person in Marblehead that is alive is now immune to the flu. But that doesn't mean in the western part. By the time the way it hit the west, Native Americans were dying at the rate of 40%. After the flu, what was it like? There were people who refused to go out. There's a vacuum, there's a fear. We know what that's like. I picked up the Time magazine and they're talking about the current epidemic and the magazine article is entitled Fear. Even the people after the flu that had natural immunity, this is what the doctor's reporting. Increase in dementia, increase in depression, increase in suicides, increase in Parkinson's disease, and damage to blood vessels in the brain. Individuals who have contracted the flu, their hair is turning white or falling out. Have no idea why. Here's what it's like since 1918. It took 27 years for them to isolate the virus. They called it the swine flu. By 1947, there's another outbreak of the flu. Again, soldiers returning from Europe. 
1950, there's a Swedish doctor who says, let's find out about it. Let's go to the permafrost, dig up some of the victims, see if we can find a virus. 1957, uh, excuse me, 1951, there's a secret expedition to Alaska to dig up the victims. No result. 1957, now we're getting into our age. Asian flu, H2N2, 70,000 Americans died. 1968, Hong Kong flu, 28,000 Americans died. 1970, outbreak. Then came, and notice we're naming it after everybody else, the Russian flu. <laughs> In 1996, Dr. Amy Kraft, who was more of a historian than a doctor, found in the Army, uh, in the Air Force Institute of Pathology, a slide taken from part of a lung of a soldier who died of the flu in 1918. The very next year, they went back to the permafrost. They found a female victim. They were able to take the virus that she died from and compare it with the slide. They now have isolated the flu of 1918. And by the way, all flus are the grandchildren of that 1918 epidemic. Then 1997, you remember it? The bird flu, you know, and we called it the Hong Kong flu. 2000, mild outbreak, and then 2003, we see something that is related to the flu, but we don't call it the flu, we call it SARS. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, H7N7. Then we have ARDS, Acute Respiratory Disease Syndrome. And in 2014, what would happen if we had a pandemic equal to 1918? Rough estimate, worldwide, 73 to 100 million people would die. In the United States, conservative estimate, 400,000 would die. That's with anti-body, uh, anti-biotics. That's with um, TAM flu, if taken within 48 hours. Worldwide, rough estimate of 100 million would die. So where are we? <laughs> well, we're different than 1918. We have a center for disease control. We have physicians that are now trained. We have emergency hospitals who respond. What do we say about Marblehead in 1918? I'm going to tell you, I'm proud of what I have found. First of all, it's a proactive community. They didn't wait for the state. They didn't wait for the federal government. They couldn't help them anyways. They did a community effort. They opened an emergency hospital. They asked for volunteers. If anything, it's a case of dedication, vision, and sacrifice. I give credit to Dr. Frank Glenn Ierson, who pushed all along, you can bring the most critical, but keep the others at home, isolate them, open the window, get fresh air, feed them. I give credit to the police chief who had the vision to say, we're taking the high school and then required his police officers to work 24 hours to get those victims there. I credit all the nurses, all the doctors that were there. Dr. Prouty lost his wife. Dr. Eveleth lost his wife. I credit a proactive Board of Health that said, we can't wait. And we're not putting out a story like Salem, don't panic. But they did put out the story we are going to address this. I credit the teachers who volunteered and served as those nurses. I credit the food providers. In fact, I credit the entire town who followed the directions. So ends that epidemic of 1918. And then I pick up the newspaper and I read the number of unvaccinated children. I look the tale of two viruses. And I guess as human beings, we know there's always going to be something new coming down the way. The one advantage, we live in a town that I think would still step up and would provide that service 
that dedication and that sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you, I haven't tapped my watch yet. <laughs> but it's, for first, uh, I, I generally research way back there, 1700, 1800, but to hit 1918 and to say, I wonder what it was like in the town of Marblehead. Remember, the high school is on the outskirts of town. And what would we do today if we had this? And as a high school assistant principal, I can remember before I retired, we met. We talked what would happen if the school had to close. Well, I told all my teachers, you better have direct deposit. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not going to get a paycheck if you don't have a direct deposit. We talked about how many hospital beds we could fit in our school. The state took a survey of all nurses in the state, all doctors. So the state is being proactive. The question is, what's coming down the way and how active and proactive the town of Marblehead will have to be. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions? Oh, by the way, I'm closing the book. Yes? <clears throat> uh, are there any statistics on whether these people who passed away were um, smokers or drinkers <clears throat> or anything? They found that those who drank had a better chance of surviving. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and that's why you, I, my wife will tell you that when I get sick, I see Dr. Jameson. <laughs> that's uh, Irish whiskey. <laughs> um, in terms of smokers, they didn't because this was a smoking society. Cigarettes, cigars, especially after World War I, women started picking up smoking of cigarettes. Prior to that, it had the image, uh, if you were a woman smoking a cigarette, uh, you were a prostitute. Yes? Out of the 42, um, over 50% of them are under the age of 16. Remember, it hits the very young pregnant women, young women. Um, uh, notice, I'm not saying 78, 80, 90 years of age. Remember, those people have already been exposed to many of the diseases. They built the, the immunity up in the system. Yes? Um, you said they, the soldiers from the Western Front broke the disease back to this country. Where did it start in the world? They're not totally sure. There's two theories. One is that it took, uh, started in France out on the battlefield. Others will tell you it started in a British military hospital. Uh, our problem is we're bringing back soldiers and sailors from the war and there's no screening process involved. It's a matter of coming back, discharging, and off you go. Um, if I had to say it probably happened at the right time, winter time, rather than spring. Yes? Can someone help me? The fans are going and I can't hear. Okay, somebody help me with that question. She's, she's wondering what would happen to families if children lost their children. This is a, this, thank you, that's an excellent question. This is a society that has extended family. Not like today, that you had grandparents around, you had parents who had uncles and aunts that took care of those children. Today would be tougher because those families we have today, those relatives are f far away from the primary family. So. If you looked at it, the culture is probably a better place for family to survive. And they went back to their schools, by the way. Yes? In the hospitals, did they separate the children from the adults? 
Believe it or not, there were no children admitted to the emergency hospitals. The family doctors in Marblehead went to your house. Uh, this is a, a, a quality that I remember, that the doctor would come to your house and would treat you at your house. And whenever the doctor came, I always felt better because this doctor had a golden retriever. And you'd be sick and the golden retriever would be up in the bedroom before the doctor would. Yeah. And they would come and out of that magic bag would come the medicine. And I truly think there was something about comfort. Uh, just recently, uh, one of my friends said to me, you know, Don, I, I've watched you treat people. I ran summer camps, and so I would have to be the nurse sometimes. And that friend said, you know, I watched you and I learned something. And he said, I became an EMT. He said, I watched you. You treated the person physically. You bandaged them up. But you spent the rest of the time talking to them. And he said, I learned you treat the patient, but you treat the wound first and then the patient second. That's what these family doctors were like in Marblehead. That's why you've got to give them credit. And it's a shame because you notice number of doctors to the individuals. One doctor, and that number has grown and grown and grown. Yes? Did the animals carry it? Excellent. With the flu, you have it being carried to swine, pigs, and then from pigs to humans. There has to be a host to let it mutate. That's why when they said swine flu, um, they were truly understanding how that was being carried. Yeah. Jonas. I think, first of all, you're in World War I in which you have sacrifices of food. Uh, there were meatless days, there, you know, wheatless days. And I think the population was exhausted. Second, uh, it hits at a time in which it comes into the cities but works out to the countryside that doesn't have the immunity, doesn't have the flu shots. I mean, I got mine tonight. I hope you did. And Today, at least the proactive component to it, that you might get a little bit on the sick side, but you'd be worse if you didn't have it. Yes? You know, that's interesting. Not one fisherman in the records has contracted the flu, but they're out in the fresh air. Uh, they're eating protein. I think that's part of the answer, but I'm not a medical doctor. But it is interesting to find in the town of Marblehead that you don't have a, f a single fisherman getting sick. Anybody else? Yes? Chris, I just want to thank you for this. It's very informative. All of this, how appropriate in the last few days, you know, with all the news and our president speaking to us about the bowl. It's comforting to know that the community is there to back you up and that there is somebody next door who would look out for you and might have food brought there. Uh, where you're in some cities where you may not even know your next door neighbor. And Pam and I did not schedule this to come at the time of this uh, of Ebola. We didn't, yeah, we didn't plan on Ebola. We didn't. Nancy. Speaking of next door neighbors, when we moved into number five Gary Street, our neighbor was Doc Iverson. And to this day, we call that house on the corner with the turret opposite the house, <laughs> Doc Iverson's. And, the only... also, and Doc Iverson was still alive when we moved in. Right. Neat, was... neat man. And even in the nursing homes, he'd be sitting there playing the organ. Yeah. The only thing I can <laughs> say bad about Dr. Arson is that he was the doctor uh, at the school doctor at the Gary School. And he could never get my twin brother or I right 
I was always David and David was Donald. But that's okay. Uh, he was a good doctor. Uh, yes? At the old Marlton High School, which is present in the middle school where I was the principal, one of the days Jason Gilliland came and gave me a tour of the old cellar that's in there. And it has 600 cops and water and food and generators as the place that we could go. Not that many people realize that, but they go through every year and they replace the water and change the amounts of everything. Mm -hmm. So that old building still has a life underneath. Yep. No yep. And, and uh, Maskinomit, where I was, there were drums of water and beds. And it was used in the snowstorm in 1970. I ain't never get it right. I do remember it that year. It was February. Uh, we had seven days of school. Two of those were paydays. And then we had vacation, and that was it. It was I did nothing but shovel. So, yes. Factories, factories shut down in Marblehead. Mail, uh, U.S. mail. The post office department still delivered the mail. Um, if you saw the picture that advertised this talk, they wore surgical masks. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much.